I'll just turn it on for you. If you want to build one of these, you start with a Gaja Classic, and you could get an old Classic or a new Classic Pro. This is a Classic Pro. This is about a $450 machine, although this white was on sale for $400. So that helped me pick the white color. I actually think it looks really nice. It's sort of a Star Wars motif. If you want to build one, the best thing to do is first look on GitHub and search for Gaja Wino and look at the distribution and download the code and look at the schematics and read over the instructions and then get an invite to the Discord group. And that's the official discussion group where the creator and the people doing the development can answer questions for you. I also created a Facebook group called Gajuino Builders, which I'll put a link to it. Um, some people just prefer to use Facebook. It's a lot friendlier because you use real names and uh, you're less likely to be attacked if you come off as a newbie on the Facebook group. There's not as much experience there, but people who have built the unit can answer questions. So why do it? Why is this better than just using this machine bare or modding this machine? Some popular modifications for this are to add a PID temperature control. So PID means that it has a temperature control that follows a specific algorithm, which uses less energy as it gets closer to the target. So it's less likely to overshoot than a pure thermostat like this normally has. So it could be more precise, but also people associate PID with having a digital display that allows you to set the temperature you want. That's a common confusion, but it's actually not what PID means. And this actually does not have PID temperature control. It does have precise, settable temperature, though, using a different algorithm. Other people might just want to do a dimmer mod or a spring mod. These machines might result in 15 bars of pressure, which is generally considered to be too much for optimum espresso. And you could try to make shots that are less than that with grind adjustments, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. The simple solution is to change the spring to limit you to nine bar, but you give up some flexibility if you do that. And another option is to go with a dimmer mod where you can just reduce the power going to the pump and that will result in less pressure. And that's a good way to do it because then you have full control. Sometimes you might want to go over nine bar. I, I would think a dimmer mod would be better than a spring mod and I don't see any reason to do both. And in fact, if you do a dimmer mod, you probably shouldn't do a spring mod. And, and likewise, if you do this Gajarino, um mod, I wouldn't change the spring because you may want to be able to set higher than nine bar pressure at some point for some, maybe it's like a light roast and you just want to experiment with more pressure to, to do more extraction. You'll be able to do that if you leave the original spring because this mod can have a pressure sensor and you could program it to not go over nine bar if that's what you want. So another benefit of this is settable pressure and, and not just settable, but you could have it try to maintain that pressure through the whole extraction, or you could have it have a pressure profile where it starts out with a lower pressure and goes to a higher pressure and back to a lower pressure. You could also have it try to control flow rates which might be useful if you want to get a certain yield within a certain amount of time. It can do time shots. It could try to estimate yield and stop at a certain yield. And you could even enhance it with a scale modification where it looks at the weight of the yield and tries to stop at a certain gram weight. And when you go ahead and build this, you have to make some decisions. There's two primary kinds of builds. One's called Lego, and that's where you take discrete components with an STM32 black pill, and you connect it to a relay and a dimmer module and a solid state relay and a power supply and various components. Wire them all together and put them in a 3D printed enclosure and you get it working that way. More recently, there's a custom PCB that you can either get through a group buy or you can order it 
directly from a, someone like PCB way. And that's the preferred way to do it because it results in cleaner wiring and it has plug-in connectors where it's easy to take out and service without having like a rat's nest of wires. Really, the only reason not to do the PCB way is because they're harder to get. You either have to wait for a group buy, which sometimes only happens every few months, or you have to order about five of them. And if you only need one, then you have four extra ones to either do nothing with or try to sell them. As far as the cost of either method, I think if you get the PCB at a group buy, it's probably a little bit cheaper to do the PCB method, but it's more expensive if you have to buy five of them and have to deal with selling them. So I actually didn't want to wait for a PCB and, and did this the Lego way, but I'm not super happy with my neatness of wiring and I do wish I had a PCB. And, and in fact, I have some that are arriving today. Whether or not I'll redo this with a PCB, I'm not sure. I mean, if it's working, I may not change it or I may build a second one. In any case, there are a couple of choices you have to make. So read on the Discord and the instructions to figure out which one to do. When you buy the components for the build, you have to decide where to buy them from. Most people get it from AliExpress and that's the lowest cost way to go, but it may take anywhere from 10 days to three or four months to get your parts. And I'm, I just don't have that kind of patience. So I ordered everything on Amazon and had most of it within a few days. The problem with Amazon, not only is it a bit more expensive, but I couldn't get exactly the parts that I wanted. For example, the optocoupler relay was not the same size and the dimmer switch was a little bit larger and that was kind of a pain. So luckily the creator of the enclosure had step files, which made it possible for me to modify them. If they were STLs, I never would have bothered. So I did get everything to fit, but I did have to change some things. I don't know how long this took me to build, but it was a real long time. Um, not only many hours of reading and learning, but probably at least 20 hours for the process. I saw someone say they did it in 12 hours and, and they sort of phrased it as 12 hours was a long time, but I don't think I could have done this in 12 hours. It, or maybe it's not that I couldn't do it, but I was custom changing parts along the way. For example, most people use a 2.4 inch display that sits on top, but I wanted a larger display and there's really no room for it up here. So I designed this to house a three and a half inch display. So I had to model that and 3D print it many times to get it to fit. And I did it in color. So I have three different colors. And then of course the code that runs on this Nexteon display is written for a 2.4 inch. Now, if you wanna run it on a 2.8 inch, it's pretty easy to change. You just download Nexteon editor and you load up the .hmi file and you go into device settings and you change it to 270 degrees. And I use discovery 2.8, we save it as the output file, which is a .tft, and that worked because the 2.8 inch display and the 2.4 inch display is the exact same pixel resolution of 320 by 240. So that was easy. But then I decided I wanted a three and a half inch display. Now that's where it gets difficult because this is 480 by 320 pixels and it will run the standard UI, but it will run it in the upper left hand corner. And in fact, if I press this button, you could see what that looks like because in order to get it to work on a 3.5, you have to hand edit this in the Nexteon editor, which is very time consuming. What I did was I scaled everything horizontally by 1.5 and everything vertically by 1.33, but there's so many elements that it could take several hours. And then if they push an update to this file, you have to redo it all over again. It would be super nice if they would make a 3.5 inch file and maintain it. But so far, there doesn't seem to be an interest in doing that because up until now, no one ever made a housing that can hold a three and a half inch display. So hopefully they'll start doing that. In the meantime, if anyone wants my file, I'll make it available, but not every screen works. I mean, they work, but most of them are small. The, the brew one though does work. I did convert that. So let's um, try this out here.
whoops. So this is like um, a 21 gram dose. I won't use my tool. I'll spare you, spare you the time of that. So when I run this, you're gonna hear that it varies the pump pressure according to what it's set for. So I'm not sure what it's configured for now. It's either gonna to try to maintain constant flow or constant pressure. I haven't actually calibrated it perfectly yet. But, but you can hear how as it senses pressure, it tries to, to change to keep at a certain amount. And in fact, this blue line, it says 7.4 bar. It's keeping that fairly even. And now it's starting to ramp down. And I believe this is programmed in as a classic profile. Now we just dump the pressure out of there. Now, if you want to steam, one thing that's really nice about this mod is that they increase the pressure that it steams at, and it has very powerful steam. It's a lot more powerful than my Breville infuser. I was really impressed with it. Anyway, this is a screen I converted. I had to keep the graph the original size because of a memory limitation of this Nexteon display, but I put the top and bottom stuff so that it filled the whole screen. If you want to print out this display housing, you could look on printables. This attaches with a magnet and it's very powerful. You can see I can slide it around, but if I try to pull it off, I can't even pull it off. You, you kind of have to slide it off. I did not have to drill a hole for the wire. It comes out here and it goes into the port where the steamer is. So I think this looks really great. I think it's the cleanest way to do a build. I'm really happy with it. I love the fact that I used a new machine with the painted color and I'm definitely, I definitely feel like I enjoyed the process. I would highly recommend building one, but you, you have to know about electronics because you have to make decisions along the way. Um, the documentation is really good, but at the same time, they had four different machines to do it for. So not everyone who works on it owns each machine. So it's not like there's one perfectly clear set of instructions for each machine. There's excellent schematics, and if you're ever in doubt about anything, what I did was printed out the schematics, and I checked off each thing, like each little connection as I did it. And even then, I made some mistakes and had to go back and fix them. But um, you're also working with line voltage, so that's potentially lethal. So you have to really have some electrical experience, and just remember to unplug it when you're working on it. If you have any more questions, please go to the Facebook group in the link and we can answer them there. Thank you.